Welcome to breakout room number two, Community Health and Clinical Care. This is a part of the sixth annual Community Engagement Poster Session. I'll be serving as the moderator. If you don't know me, my name is Kajwa Lor. I'm founding chair and associate professor with MCW School of Pharmacy. I do work around building cultural humility skills with immigrant refugee populations as well as uh, Spanish speaking populations. I'm excited to hear about the work that you all are doing um, in community health and clinical care. I think this is a smaller group, so feel free to share your video so we can see some engagement as well. Um, and as we begin the session, I just wanted to acknowledge everyone for being here and spending the time with us today. The poster session will be very quick. It sounds like there's eight presenters today in this room. So there will be have each presenter will have five minutes for their presentation and three minutes for the Q&A. If there is a specific question, we would like to see if you could reserve that question and place it in the chat room. Um, I will be serving as the moderator and I'll be monitoring the chat in the Q&A and posing the questions to the presenter. And we also have a timekeeper as well. If you have any technical difficulties, uh, you can actually leave the breakout room at any time and ask for help with Kelsey Heindel. And if you are finishing up a present uh, presentation, you also want to go to another room, um, you are also able to do that. You could actually leave this breakout room and go to another one. So uh, I will do it away. Thank you for again for being here with the poster session. And the first one that's up is Caitlin Sonnentag, who is a MS3 from MCW Green Bay, and she'll be speaking on emergency department utilization. I think we've also asked our presenters to share their screen. Um, so, but if you are not able to do so, I can actually ask our timekeeper to pull it up as well. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to share this. All right. Um, okay, so I am a third year medical student at MCW Green Bay. Um, and I got the idea for this um, project because I was in EMS prior to medical school. And it was interesting to me how many people used the emergency department for non-emergent conditions. So I wanted to just look into a little bit as to why this might be the case. Um, so for my research, looking at it, a couple of the key reasons that I decided to focus on and look at a little bit more in depth were um, lack of knowledge about or access to affordable care that's outside of the emergency department. And additionally, patients' perceptions of the acuity of their conditions being inconsistent with what ED providers' perceptions were. Um, so purpose was to investigate these reasons, um, specifically at the Bellin Emergency Department in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And then additionally, to provide patients with information on when they should seek care at an alternative healthcare facility and specific alternatives for care in the area. Ultimately with wanting to decrease the number of patients that use the emergency department so that our emergency department providers can give faster and better care to people with actual emergent conditions. So my project was conducted during August, 2019 to February, 2020 at Bellin, the Bellin ED in Green Bay, Wisconsin during the hours when urgent care locations were open Patients were considered for the survey if they received and maintained throughout their stay in the emergency department an acuity level of four or five by the ED providers. And then at the end of the survey, patients were asked if they would like the informational handout on criteria for seeking care at an emergency department, urgent care, or primary care um, location, and then also specific addresses of these facilities in the area. Um, just for time's sake, I'm going to move on to my conclusions and kind of touch on um, the specific results uh, in my conclusion section. If I can get this bar with all of your lovely faces on to the side and outside of <laughs> the conclusion section. Okay, there we go. 
Um, okay, so um, my conclusions were that indeed patients' perceptions of their acuity level were inconsistent with providers' perceptions with 75% of patients reporting their problem as urgent or life-threatening, which is not consistent with an acuity level of four or five. Additionally, majority of patients stated that their problem was an emergency or couldn't wait for a primary care physician's appointment, which is also not consistent with an acuity level of four or five. Um, additionally, majority of patients stated that they would use reliable alternatives to getting care outside of the ED if these existed. So there's a lack of knowledge about alternative locations to receive this care. And then the thing that made me pretty happy was half of these patients stated that they would like the guide to help them choose when they should go elsewhere. So that suggests to me that with education, patients would be willing to change their practice of using the Bell and ED for non-emergent conditions. So for future studies, it would be useful to follow up with the patients that actually received these handouts to see if they use these alternatives to the ED. And then if people did end up using these alternatives, it would be good to include an informational handout with the ED discharge paperwork. So that way we could reduce the number of patients using the Bell and ED, and that would overall decrease the ED provider's workload and allow them to provide better and faster care to patients with actual emergent conditions. Um, so then at, there at the bottom, you can see my acknowledgements. And then on the next page, if I can go forward. Yeah. Um, so this is just the guide that I used, um, just kind of showing like on the top when you should make a provider, um, primary care provider appointment, certain things that you should maybe go to an urgent care and then things that you should definitely go to an emergency department for or call 911 and then gave them a link to where they could get more information on it. And then additionally, here's just the addresses of the locations for Bell, Bell and Health places um, in the area. So that's it if anyone has any questions. All right, we will open it up for questions. Caitlin, this is David Nelson. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I think many of us are thinking about this. Um, yeah. It's not a lack of interest. It's a matter of forming a question. I'm always curious about how we might differentiate, how a community might differentiate between what they consider a real, what they consider emergent and how we consider that something to be emergent or not. There seems to be a disconnect there. Can you comment on that? Um, I kind of don't understand your question. Sorry. Okay. So a, a physician may go, well, this isn't an emergency, but a community member will go, yes, it is. And, and so how do you, how do you manage? Because you have an answer. Uh, you, you say that some people do think that this, this was emergent enough mm -hmm. that they should go to the ED. So there's a disconnect between the two, the community and the medical team. Right. How do we decrease that, that, that distance between the two? What needs to happen? Yeah, so I guess that was kind of the very basic um, goal of kind of just like this resource here. Now, this isn't necessarily saying like certain life-threatening things versus not, but this is kind of things that just to push people in the right direction of hey, if you do have, you know, cold and flu-like symptoms, now granted this is pre-COVID, I just want to say that, um, but, you know, you can go to an urgent care rather than an emergency room. And I think just, I mean, the answer to that is to educate the community and how exactly to do that, I'm not sure. Um, but that's why I was thinking specifically with this, if we could give them a resource like this with their discharge paperwork to just kind of be like, okay, so we kind of, ass ass we assessed your condition to be non-life-threatening or non-emergent. So here's reasons why you maybe should come emergently versus not, I guess that was kind of my very beginning like thought of how we could do this.
right. Thank you so much for the question. I think we have time for one question, if there are any. All right, thank you so much for your poster presentation. Thank you. If there are any remaining questions, um, what we've asked is that folks can still write them in the chat um, and there's definitely still some conversations that can be still be had. All right, we will move to the second presenter, um, Dr. Taylor Sonnenberg, who will be speaking on partnering with community leaders to enhance patient care in the emergency department. Oh, is Ashley Padlet gonna actually present? Okay, great. We're gonna tag team it actually. So hello everyone. Um, are we able to share the screen? I'm, I'm unable to with uh, Caitlin still having her slide up. Let me stop. Stop share. Okay, perfect. I can start talking while we're figuring out the technology piece of it. Okay, perfect. So we don't get behind. Um, I'm Ashley Pavlik. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And uh, Dr. Taylor Sonnenberg and I run the Division of Community and Population Health. And our poster surrounds a educational curriculum that we established about a year and a half ago that we call the DOORS curriculum, which stands for Developing an Outlook on Other Realities. So the purpose of this uh, was embedded in the Emergency Medicine Resident Conference, their weekly conference. And the purpose was to focus on social determinants of health and on vulnerable groups that we see in the emergency department. So our main goals were um, establish the importance of social determinants of health and that they are integral, understanding of patient social determinants are integral to health outcomes enhancing the empathy of our residents and providers, increasing awareness of resources both in our emergency department and also in the local community. And then four, and of course, most importantly, always ultimately is enhancing patient care. So um, to do this, to this end, we partnered with uh, several different groups on campus with overlapping missions. So we partnered with the um, Department of Global Health, the Kern Institute, CAPS, we reached out to colleagues in internal medicine, nephrology, psychiatry, and social work, both at uh, Freighter and at the VA. We also partnered with community leaders, including the Consortium for Hmong Health, the Mission uh, Homeless Shelter, the Guest House, the Milwaukee Healthcare Consortium, uh, community advocates, and several other partners. We um, invited them to come uh, to speak on campus approximately monthly. Um, and then I'll have uh, Taylor discuss the uh, results of our curriculum. So, so I'd like to direct your attention to the top um, graph. So that is just looking at, we asked residents prior to the curriculum, how familiar they were with different groups um, in their own personal life. So outside of the hospital or clinical practice, how familiar are they? Or, um, with different types of groups. And you can, looking at the graph um, in the uh, blue and orange bars are never and rarely, so not very familiar with those types of groups. And you can see that prisoners, hemodialysis, Hmong population, refugees, those that are sex trafficked, uh, pros, uh, uh, sex workers, and um, the undomiciled population are, are some of the um, most commonly um, groups that are unfamiliar, um, unfamiliar to our residents. Um, so it kind of highlights the need for our, our curriculum. Um, and then the bottom two graphs are showing um, the um, how familiar our residents are with uh, resources both before the curriculum, which is that middle graph, and then after the curriculum, um, which is the lower graph. And again, it's a lot of the sim same um, groups that uh, our residents were unfamiliar with the types of resources that are available to them to help these populations, um, specifically like the prisoners, the Hmong population, refugees, um, and then sex workers and those who are sex trafficked. After our um, one year of our curriculum, we again asked their familiarity and you can see the, the um, 
uh, asterisks represent those that are statistically significant um, improvements in, in familiarity with the resources available. Um, so again, some of those same, um, same groups that they were unfamiliar with, uh, prisoners, hemodialysis, refugees, those um, involved in sex trafficking, the Hmong population, sex workers, and uh, shooting victims. Um, overall, looking at our curriculum, it led to a um, change in practice on average of 52% of the time. Um, so this kind of shows that our curriculum really can um, improve um, patient care overall. Um, we want to also send a special thank you to Sarah Russell. She's our um, third year Third, third year already medical student who is uh, who put together all of the data collected all the data and put together the graphs. Um, and so going forward um, with our curriculum it is a continuing curriculum we want to expand the number of uh, topics and um, uh, community partners um, that we have. Uh, we also just um, completed a community engagement day where our residents were able to visit some of these community partners that uh, um, we highlighted during our curriculum. And that was quite successful. And actually in this time of COVID, that's, that's where we really, we've been pushing for this for a year and a half, but we were given that opportunity because the residents are no longer going to their national conference, but they were able to, um, for example, visit some of the mental health resources at the VA. They were permitted to go to the Milwaukee County Correctional Facility. Um, with, you know, using special precautions and engage in other community, both virtual, virtually, but also in person. And the residents found it to be very meaningful. It makes a big difference to be able to actually see, you know, where your patients are living and coming from. And then our last future direction would be to form an actual track within our residency for those interested in social emergency medicine. And we're starting the conversations surrounding that for those who wanna do a more in-depth dive in the three years during our residency. Now we would like to open it up for questions. Thanks for that interesting presentation. And I always love when people in different departments get out to the community. Can you both talk about from your perspective how this is going to change the practice of medicine in your department after you learning, learning what you guys learned in the course of this year? Sure, well, I think there's some very tangible ways that it, it already has started to change. So um, perhaps the most um, the most recent example is that uh, Dr. Sonnenberg, when we went to the Community Engagement Day, actually led a, led a group of people who went to the Milwaukee County Correctional Facility and learned there actually all the resources that our um, inmates who we see in the emergency department have access to when we discharge them. Because that's sort of a black box. We don't really know. They learned that there's certain forms that there's certain forms that we as the emergency provider are supposed to be filling out. We learned what all specialty care they can have access to. They learn what happens to the medications that we prescribe. So that's very practical. Um, we also uh, Another example of, of something that um, maybe isn't as practical in terms of uh, what we're actually doing during discharge, but, is it, but it was important in terms of enhancing empathy, which I think is a big part of um, thriving in the emergency department especially, but I'm sure in every field um, and protecting against burnout. Uh, we had a speaker last year who runs the outpatient hemodialysis program come and talk to us about what it's really like to be a patient on hemodialysis, which of course none of our none of our residents are, and on, and really none of our faculty, to my knowledge, are um, about how exhausting it is, about how that really what that really looks like for a week. You know, you go and you spend hours and hours, three days a week, and after that you're tired, and usually you're getting up early. Usually you don't have access to someone who you know you usually don't access to a car. Um, most people get public transportation to get there, so it's. Um, a rather, it's been a rather incredible opportunity and a lot of aha moments, um, both on the practical side and also on the empathy for our patients side. That's great. There was just, one question in the chat as well. Um, what would you say was the biggest challenge in creating and implementing the curriculum? Yeah. 
Hmm. I'm trying to think through, um, you know, we didn't meet a lot of resistance with the DOORS curriculum. We were very fortunate that our chairperson and the directors of our educational programming for the residents are very, were very in favor of this. Um, we did meet some difficulty with the community engagement piece of that, um, bit of finding a time that was protected for our residents to fit that in. So um, it just so happened that co this is the one, the one small way that COVID worked out for us because it opened up this uh, block of time because we wanted to be protected time. We didn't want the residents to have to do this in addition to all of their normal requirements. Um, because I think they would look at it as a burden instead of as an opportunity, but they were able to get a protected, a full day um, to go out and really engage and really do, have fun um, doing this. So I think that piece of it was the most difficult, but now that we've seen how useful and helpful it is, I think we have more um, power to uh, make it a regular part of the curriculum. All right, I'm, I'm so sorry, Time's, time is up. So thank you so much for presenting. Um, now we will move on to the third uh, poster on factors influencing show rates of emergency department referrals to primary care clinics. It's by Miranda Brown, Greg Statter, and Dr. Decker. There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Miranda. I'm a third year medical student um, at MCW's Milwaukee campus. And as we heard from our former presentations, utilization of emergency departments for non-urgent conditions um, is a well-known problem. So I partnered with Milwaukee Healthcare Partnership, which created the Emergency Department Care Coordination Program in 2007. And this program allows providers from the emergency department to refer low-income unestablished community members to primary care follow-up appointments. And there are a total of eight adult EDs who schedule referral appointments at over 20 safety net clinics throughout Milwaukee County. And here's a map of where all the clinic locations are. And in the years of 2018 to 2019, over 5,000 appointments were scheduled with a 43% show rate to these follow-up appointments, leaving some room for improvement. Um, you can see the EDCC appointments and show rates here. So the goals of this project were to identify factors influencing these show rates to follow-up appointments and then develop program interventions to increase show rates um, and then ultimately decrease avoidable ED visits. So the way we did this was we utilized the My Health Direct database of de-identified patient information, which was where um, ED providers would input all the referral information. So we included all referring emergency departments and then um, for the safety net clinics, we included all federally qualified health centers, and then we performed a logistic regression um, utilizing these data elements. And what we found was that older, older adults are more likely to attend follow-up appointments with those age 65 and up having a 57% um, show rate, while our younger patients ages 16 to 39 only have a 38% show rate. We also found that follow-up appointments closer to the date that the patients were seen in the ED were more likely to be attended. So if appointments were made within the first five days after they were seen, we had a 49% show rate, while those 15, 16 plus days out would be closer to 32%. We also found that our uninsured patients were more likely to, to attend follow-up appointments um, compared to their Medicaid counterparts. And then show rates also varied amongst the individually federally qualified health centers. We also found that patient gender, um, which referring ED and then provider type, meaning if a MD or um, a nurse practitioner or another member of the care team um, made the referral, um, this didn't have a statistically significant difference on show rates. So what we found is that more work is needed to engage our younger um, individuals to ensure they attend these follow-up appointments. And um, given that we have um, appointments are more likely to be attended if they're closer to the, when they were in the ED, it's important that our safety net clinics have ample appointment slots um, in a couple days window. And then we also are going to look at why there are differences in show rates uh, between um, federally qualified health centers. So um, for next steps, 
we want to work with our federally qualified health center leadership to kind of um, conduct interviews to see like how they are in implementing this program in their individually individual clinics and um, any barriers that they have to um, completing what we would say is our best practices or things we know um, that will increase show rates. And then um, we also want to work with our ED leadership on who to best target as far as um, patient populations who would be likely to attend these appointments. Um, so yeah, I'm open to taking any questions. Right. Hello. Yep, we can, you can hear, hear you. Me? Oh, okay, <laughs> great. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Miranda. Um, I was wondering, are there any, is there any insight into how these patients will be getting to their appointments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think we, one of our theories for um, the reason between differences in show rates is depending on which safety net clinic they go to, some safety cl net clinics have different um, policies on if they reach out to the patient before the appointment to see if they need help with um, transportation and things like that. So depending on which F um, safety net clinic they go to, you know, they may provide like help with transportation and things like that. So that's kind of one of the things we wanted to dive into with our like FQHCs to see if they offered any of those services to see if it does make a difference in show rates. So. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Miranda, nice presentation. Do you give the patients an option to follow up or is it, hey, we're going to set you up. You came to the ED, but now we're going to set you up with a primary care. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, they do get an option and they also, when they're making these uh, appointments, um, the person who's scheduling it shows them a list of all the different safety net clinics. So patients can decide which safety net clinic they want to go to, whether that's, you know, what's closest to their, you know, um, home or whether, you know, there's like, for instance, um, a lot of our like Lat lat Latino populations prefer, you know, 16th street, um, because, you know, they have a lot of Hispanic providers, you know, so it's kind of based on like patient preferences on where they want to go. So we let patients decide. And then um, they're also able to like pick which appointment slots and things like that, that they would prefer. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much for presenting. So now we will move to our fourth presenter, Measuring Patient Length of Visit and Reducing Wait Times at the Philippine Center Free Medical Clinic by Jonathan Slimovich, Cameron Stewart, and Dr. Mendoza Lemus. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan. I'm a third year medical student at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So in 2019, approximately 26.1 million Americans were uninsured. For many uninsured patients, free medical clinics are an important mechanism for how they can get medications and medical care. The Philippine Center Free Medical Clinic is one such clinic. It serves a large number of patients in Greenfield, Wisconsin, many of which are coming in with chronic conditions, including hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. Unfortunately, many patients fail to return to clinic every month, meaning they can potentially spend several months without their medications. While there are many reasons which can contribute to a patient failing to return to clinic, one reason is the duration of their clinic visit, which I'll be referring to as total clinic time. And this is approximately 80 minutes. The goal with this project was to reduce the total clinic time with the hopes this will help re improve return rates to the clinic. So our objectives for this project were two. First, we wanted to see the time spent at each stage of the process. So for a typical visit, there are several different stages. There's arrival, triage, lab, a physician visit, and then medication dispensation. Second, we want to make specific changes to improve if any of those steps were taking up too long of a time. And the way we did this is we used de-identified timesheets, which I have an example of here, if the screen will let me, there we go. 
Um, and so as you can see on this timesheet, these were attached to all patient charts. And so each stage is filled out by a different member of the clinic team. So for instance, if the nurse took the patient to triage, they'd fill out the time taken for triage and the time the patient finished triage. And so by using all of these different timesheets, we could then calculate the average amount of time spent at each stage during clinic, and also the average amount of time spent between various stages of clinic. And these are shown on figure one and figure two. So figure one shows three graphs um, showing time spent at the triage stage, lab stage, and physician stage against total time in clinic, which is that gray line at the top. Figure two shows one stage, medication dispensation against total time spent in clinic, which is again, the gray line at the top of the screen. As you might be able to see just by looking at the graphs, medication dispensation clearly takes up a large amount of time. Actually, it was about 50% of the total clinic visit. In addition, there seems to be a strong connection between this stage and the total clinic time. We want to kind of dive in further. So we decided to use a regression analysis. Now, intuitively, every stage would be expected to show some correlation upon total clinic time. However, we want to see which stage had the most impact. What we found is that two stages had statistically significant correlation analysis with the total time spent in clinic. And these were the time between arrival and triage and also the time of med dispensation. And we focused on med dispensation because it took up 50% of the total clinic time. Its correlation coefficient was 0.95 and it had a p-value of less than 0.05. And so we made two specific changes. And you can see this on figure two again. The first was a reorganization of the pharmacy room. So typically meds are delivered by the medical students and might waste a lot of time searching for meds in the pharmacy room. Unfortunately, this did not show a significant reduction in total clinic time. The second change was the decision to pre-register patients and pre-package meds, which actually decreased time spent during the stage by 50%. Now, if you're looking closely at figure two, you might notice that there's no other line for visits 10 and 11. And the reason for this is that these, this change was made in the context of COVID-19. So during COVID, the clinic transitioned to a solely medication dispensation format. So basically there was no lab visits, there was no physician visits, instead the patients would have to come pull up, be given their meds, and then they would have to leave. So the clinic format changed dramatically. In conclusion, approximately 50% of the total clinic time was spent at this medication dispensation stage, and this result was statistically significant. In addition, pre-packaging medications and pre-registering patients succeeded in reducing the wait time uh, at the time at this stage by 50%. There were several limitations to this project. First, our timesheets restricted the amount of information we could collect. So for instance, we would know for patient A how much time it took to fill their meds, but not if those meds had changed or if they were the same from a prior visit. In addition, many timesheets did not have all categories filled out, which meant that either some categories were gonna overlap or weren't gonna get accurate values in all of them. And finally, as you can see in table one in the bottom left, there was large variation in the number of patients seen at each clinic visit. One thing we're looking at in the future is using variance to try and find a connection between these numbers because it can change dramatically for how many patients are seen in clinic. Future directions for this project are a few. First, we wanna make sure these changes are sustainable once we, knock on wood, lift from the post-COVID time. In addition, we want to see if these changes are actually gonna improve return rates to clinic. So we already tried one way to see if they would improve return rates. We tried a phone survey reaching out to patients. Um, but we were only able to reach about three patients out of 28. So we clearly need to find a better way, find a way to connect with the patients. I wanna make several acknowledgements that this project cannot be completed without the full support of all members of the Philippine Center for Medical Clinic staff, um, including but not limited to volunteers, med students, lab techs, nurses, physicians. Um, special thanks to Marita Prill, Linda Ramos, and Dr. Violeta Singsong, who's the medical director. And I also wanna thank the Biostatistics Consulting Service, MCW, for their help with some data analysis. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. I actually have a question. So um, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, with the clinic, the Philippine Center Free Medical Clinic, um, were there any, I guess, benchmarks that you could see with other clinics, whether it be with the SEU or other free clinics, kind of how that comparison might look? That's a great point. So I haven't, we haven't checked with any other clinics in the area. So I'm not sure about benchmarks versus how they would fare with return rates, for instance. Um, one thing that makes it slightly difficult, at least 
at this clinic um, is that it runs entirely on a, a paper chart system. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it a little bit trickier to track versus if you had like an online system, which monitoring the charts that way. Got it. Uh, there was a question in the chat as well. Were you able to control for the number of comorbidities? No, not um, entirely. But so for instance, we were not looking specifically as if for instance, like if the patient with hypertension came in and needed their medications versus if they had hypertension and diabetes and came in and needed their medications. Instead, we were just looking at the average time it took for those meds to be dispensed overall. So it's a great point because we would expect them to take longer time if they had more comorbidities. What adds on to that, however, is that let's say they come in with a higher blood pressure. Well, that might take time for the physician to actually make a change to the medication, which implies you have to go into the pharmacy room, find the medication, and then add to the patient's bag. So there clearly are several other factors at play here. Um, and this is just kind of one broad scale look at the whole system. Um, but one thing I wanted to kind of bring up is that it's clear that this decision to pre-register patients and pre-packaged medications is not entirely 100% efficient. What I mean by that is that you're shifting the time spent in clinic, the time spent beforehand, or providers are doing this beforehand. The key difference is patients are not waiting during this time, but it really is not possible without people being willing to put in time alone beforehand. All right, thank you so much for presenting. Thank you. We'll move on to the next presenter, uh, presenter number five, Empowering Primary Care Family Network Towards Nutrition Behavior Change by Marie Balfour and Dr. Brian Johnston. Perfect, hi everyone, can you hear me? Great. My name is Marie Balfour and I'm an M2 at MCW and my project is Empowering Primary Care Family Networks Toward Nutrition Behavior Change. And I worked with Dr. Brian Johnson in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. My project started as an offshoot of the MCW Food Doctors Program, which Dr. Nelson is a foundational member of. He's in our small group today. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, Food Doctors is a three lesson interactive MyPlate based curriculum given by MCW students within the program to third graders uh, at the Milwaukee Academy of Science and the St. Marcus Lutheran School. And these lessons are typically given in the classroom during the school year, but a future goal of the project has always been to adapt the lessons to a virtual format to reach a larger audience and then also to involve parents and community members as well in the curriculum. So that's where my project came in and it was a two pronged approach. So the first um, prong was adapting the curriculum to an online platform. And then the second part was having phone conversations with parents and community members in, within their family unit to see some of the influences and challenges that they faced when it, it came to nutrition. So due to our um, community partnerships through the, the Food Doctors Program, we were able to recruit participants from the St. Marcus Lutheran School, Milwaukee Academy of Science, and then also the All Saints Family Medicine Clinic. You can see on that little map all of the community sites that we that we pulled from. So for the first part of the project, we had uh, participants able to participate live via WebEx in the lessons or uh, access them asynchronously through YouTube recordings. Um, so they could access them whenever worked best for them. You can see that QR code in the middle of the project. It can be used to access the YouTube recording of the first lesson. And uh, we have an example of one of the slides that we use just so you can get a feel for it of comparing, you know, those MyPlate frameworks to, um, in this example, a pepperoni pizza. So you can see the differences there. And then the, the virtual lessons were, uh, once they were recorded, we were able to distribute them to over 4,500 individuals through the school's social media and parent platform channels as well. And then for the second part, the, we used semi-structured phone interviews with 15 participants. We were able to interview parents and then also some parents with their children as well. And you can see the, uh, some of the question prompts on the bottom left there, but really getting at the influences and challenges that they were facing with their nutrition within their family unit. And so after you know, recording the interviews, transcribing them, I had some help from another uh, medical student researcher to reach theme saturation within um, the Dedu software and code the interviews. But we landed on these five themes. So you can see that in that little flower there in the, the bottom middle. 
So the first was perceptions of healthy eating among different age groups. So within the parents, we saw a lot of online research where they're, you know, taking matters into their own hands and really looking online for certain things where the children, when we interviewed them, they really had a strong connection to their parents' guidance. So when we asked them about things that they thought were healthy, things that impacted their nutrition, they really cited those conversations with their parents as a huge influence. And then family member influence on a healthy diet. So we had a lot of people mention that these large family gatherings around the holidays or whenever they were around their families, they would eat more and maybe less healthy, but they really enjoyed that time spent with their family. And then moving on to factors that influence healthy eating in families. So this is when we really got at some of the limitations and challenges that family members face. So a lot of parents cited lack of time, lack of financial resources in order to prepare those meals that they you know, kind of said, oh, these are the healthy meals I want to prepare, but I, I'm limited in some of the, the resources that I can spend on that. And then roles of extended family and nutrition. We had some really great stories from participants just about a family member maybe going through a weight loss journey or having a family member babysit their children and having a huge impact on their nutrition choices, uh, kind of rooted in their, their family dynamic. And then family communication around food. We were able to see a lot of parents use the meal time and also family shopping events as times to have those conversations with their children about what's healthy, what's not healthy, and, and how that went into what they were going to buy at the store and then what they were, you know, going to cook for dinner and things like that. So future work for this project could really delve into the online uh, nutrition curriculum and seeing how that compares to the current food doctors in person lessons. We were able to, since we did this pilot over the summer, we were able to, um, currently we're doing online lessons for our school partners given the COVID restrictions. So having that pilot over the summer was helpful just to be able to get that off the ground running and into the future for this next year as we continue the program in the schools. And a, you know, a huge uh, acknowledgement goes out to our community partners. I think this project wouldn't have been possible without them and the existing relationship that, that Food Doctors has had with them over the years. So thank you, Anne. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, it looks like there's a question in the chat. What influenced your choice of the age of the kids? And do you think this age group is a prime population for intervention for future healthy eating? Yeah, so the, the traditional food doctors program targets third grade students. So we tried to target that as well. We had a few siblings that joined the program of younger and older ages. So, you know, that that always comes into play when you have a nutrition curriculum like this. I believe we targeted third grade students specifically at this school, um, exactly what you had said, given that it's a good age for the intervention. And the schools that we were working with didn't provide any uh, nutritional curriculum currently at the school. So we were able to kind of adapt it to the third grade level for them when we go in and give the lessons and then also over the summer with the virtual lessons. Marie, thank you for that nice presentation. What do you think the mechanism is for empowering family nutrition choices, kids influencing parents and siblings and parents influencing kids. Right. And I think we saw that a lot with the interviews, you know, when we're talking about, you know, go, going grocery shopping as a family, things like that, you know, the parent, the things that the parents are saying to the kids and the kids, the feedback they're getting from the kids is, is a lot more than I had originally thought, you know, it's not just the parents setting the rules. I think the kids kind of have a back and forth with the parents and so I think, you know, currently with the lessons, we're sending kids home with recipes to try at home. And I think that's kind of the way that we're trying to get at involving the parents. But I think you can take it a step further now that we kind of know a little bit more about what the parents are thinking and create things that maybe they can go home with that are, you know, keep them interacting with the parents, keep that conversation going. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. We'll move to the sixth presenter, Dr. David Nelson, who's providing a presentation on qualitative findings of Latinx families experiences following a physical activity and nutrition program. Oh, 
I think we just need to unmute. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, goodness. Thank you. I'll start again. <laughs> First, I want to thank my partners at Marquette University and the Nettie Community Center. To maximize the health of all citizens, there is a need for all of us to participate in life lifestyle activities. Within the Latinx community, this need is especially great with an increased risk for diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Community-facing programs around nutrition and fitness are an excellent way to connect with the community in a culturally appropriate manner. Our methods, we had a year long program with students from the Bruce Guadalupe School uh, who participated in a nutrition and physical activity programming several times a week. This was done with sixth, seventh and an eighth graders. In addition, parents were engaged in the process and participated in such things like camping, skiing, rock climbing, and mother-son programs, father-daughter programs that often went beyond just uh, fitness and nutrition. Following the program, we conducted semi-structured interviews with families, both in person and then over Zoom when the pandemic hit. Zoom was actually a very effective way to connect with parents as parents and parents and children were both very understanding of the technology that we used. Families could either speak English or Spanish depending on their preference. The results, 25 families responded enthusiastically. Some of the results that are in, that are in discussion right now and in uh, evaluation, first off, the program impacted the capacity to learn new skills. Second, families saw changes in students in families. For example, one mother said, well, he has been improving his eating habits. He has been doing a lot more movements. He was just like video game kid that wouldn't want to go out. And after when he started the program, he's been more active in everything. In addition, students also identified changes within themselves, said one participant. So basically, like it got me out of my comfort zone. I used to not like going outside. I've been going to fit and fit is like taking me outside more and more and I get used to it. What I found interesting as an evaluator for the program is that there was something very interesting going on. In the last presentation, Ms. Belfort spoke of the influence of children on families and families on children. And there's something about that that we really do need to investigate more. In addition to talking about nutrition and physical activity and learning basic skills, there was things that the students and the parents were able to talk about in such things as collaboration, social support, resiliency. Now they might not have used those words, but those were the phrases that came out. Some of our implication, implications, despite the challenge of COVID, families did go on and understand health and wellness, not only pre-COVID, but following COVID. Now, many of these families, these are working class families, families that work and take care of their children, oftentimes in intergenerational situations. Many times the grandparents didn't necessarily agree with changing nutritional habits, especially from the Latinx community. But when it was for one of their children or grandchildren, especially the grandchildren, they often saw the need and would follow along with it. Two, families felt supported. For those of us that are in community engagement and community research and medicine, Families need to feel supported. We might not, they might not like the answers we often will give them, especially if it's a burden to things that they may have, they feel like they have to do. But when they feel supported, anything is possible. And three, there is an ongoing need for programming that is support that supports family health. We've been doing this work around fitness and nutrition for better part of 40 years, and I've been in this the entire time. Programs that, that have community buy-in, 
that have community engagement and that are longer lasting are more likely to be uptook, uptaken by the community. We need to be in a place where we can support health, wellness, education, as well as such things as families that are food insecure, housing unstable, and in this time of pandemic that are economic unstable. And despite the challenges that are facing the Latinx community, there is a hunger for programs like these. I know the partners on this project, we are continually looking for funding. We just submitted a grant application, not only that would continue this programming, but would also better understand food security that these families are facing. We found that many of our families were food insecure and despite being food insecure, which means either worried about or not having enough, they still were interested in proper and positive nutrition as well as physical activity that can be supported by the entire family. Thank you for this time to present today. That was amazing. Thank you for presenting. Um, we'll open it up for one question. So you have time for one question. All right, there's one in the chat. Some activities or sports can be challenging to do to the cost of participation in these sports. What do you think is another challenge that can be overcome by a grant program? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, some of these sports have a cost associated with them, but what we found from that, especially when a grant can pay for it, is that students have this ability to try something new, to get outside of, of, their, uh, of their comfort zones. Um, and as much as we can, we can put, we can put localized uh, connections around these. Um, we know, for example, that even just going to, along Lake Michigan for some students is a, is a, is a, is a unique phenomenon. Uh, there are students in the city of Milwaukee that have never been to the lake. Uh, less so on the, you know, with the proximity of where the United Community Center is, but there are students that haven't experienced um, the benefit of Lake Michigan or the benefit of swimming in a pool or trying something new. So as much as we can to provide these opportunities uh, of engagement in a way that is both um, supportive and culturally appropriate, it, it is something that we should consider more of. There is actually time for one more question. Um, what, what a great program. Is there discussions of measuring long-term outcomes, obesity or rates of diabetes, and trying to justify that preventative measures like these are cost-effective? Yeah, it's, boy, that's a good question because there are so many factors that go into it. What we have seen, especially with this, the idea of health is, is all encompassing and it's not just what people's physical measurements might be, but it really is their attitudes towards this. And one of the things that I can see for us as we look at this, we ought to be looking at this over the course of several generations and not just an individual BMI. And when we talk about this issue of collaboration, social support, resiliency, you know, I'd be also interested not in, in how these individuals do if they do better over the long term, but if they're more likely to go to college, if they're more likely to have uh, jobs that are engaging with them. Um, because we're seeing, and I asked the families this, what are some of the things that, the, that you think that the kids will take with them? And in many cases in the Latinx community, for example, um, little boys don't normally, don't normally cook. Uh, but in these instances, little boys were learning skills that could take them into the, you know, take them into the kitchen beyond just grilling. And so they were preparing things and that can translate to other areas of their life if they're willing to try. And so um, it not only is a supportive of the health, but that idea of trying new things and not feeling like you you shouldn't try because either you don't know how or you might fail at something. Hey, thank you so much for presenting, Dr. Nelson. We'll move on to the second to last presenter, Sanaya Bathina, impacting pharmacy practice based on community-centered interventions at Community Pharmacy. 
Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sanaya. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student at the Medical College of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. And today I will be talking about my research project that I worked on on my longitudinal rotation at Walgreens since June, um, which was impacting a pharmacy practice based on community-centered interventions at community pharmacy. It is accumulation of all the quality improvement services that we incorporated using patient uh, feedback as a part of my administrative and management rotation. To give a brief background, community pharmacies are a main hub for a lot of patients to walk in and get access to care on a daily basis. Uh, and these community pharmacies provide comprehensive health services, which can be in the form of preventative care, immunizations, keeping up with their vaccinations, point of care testing, such as the recently implemented COVID-19 testing, medication synchronization services, and so on. The goal is to make all of these services accessible and personalized to the needs and requirements of the community and to the patient as they help with the well being of the community. Pharmacists form uh, the core and the frontline medical team that engage in community outreach through their, exp uh, through their extensive uh, scope and knowledge of practice. All the services provided at a pharmacy work at enhancing the care by keeping the community perspective in mind. For uh, viewers who are unaware, medication therapy management is when a pharmacist reaches out to a patient, uh, and this might include a telehealth call where each medication is discussed in detail. Medication synchronization is an initiator with a core mission to keep the community well being in mind. So it coordinates all the refills a patient might have to a single pickup day so that they don't have to make multiple or unnecessary or unavoidable trips to the pharmacy. Our purpose with this study was to evaluate how these incorporations of community centered interventions could make an impact on pharmacy practices and the betterment in general. Going on, we started out by assessing immunization rooms across Walgreens uh, area 54. So it's West Wisconsin, so Milwaukee to Lake Mills area. And uh, we were looking to collect more community member interactions to evaluate process flow and community experience for patients who were evaluating getting an immunization. We wanted to streamline the process to determine if it was a safe, private, uh, atmosphere where we could provide uh, community members with their services and meet their needs. An example would be having like a proper immunization room to ensure uh, privacy. Another example or feedback we had is getting chairs or furniture that accommodates for people with disabilities or the elderly population uh, with proper seat handles or support system that they can hold on to while getting up or getting their vaccination in general. Another initiative we incorporated was performing community outreach calls where we modified the call verbiage uh, based on the meeting the needs of the patient. So a big component of this call would just lead us to discuss uh, medication synchronization program, which is the SATR, where we had community members who had two or more medications for chronic disease management, such as high cholesterol or hypertension. And we would coordinate the pickup for a single pickup day so that they don't have to make unnecessary trips to a pharmacy. Um, other results included that seven out of the eight stores that I had personally visited had a fair to poor or needed improvement for workflow and community, sir, and community experience. That was mostly because some of the stores in Milwaukee didn't have a proper immunization room. It was just a barrier. At that point, we were trying to incorporate a proper and build a proper room. And that happened in a, it was a quick turnaround of one month. Uh, Besides that, we involved feedback to make sure the process was short uh, and community inquiries were answered where we were answering about employees wearing masks due to COVID or PPE being supplied as the immunization rooms are small and you would be within six feet of someone. For the medication synchronization project and community focus calls, we uh, received suggestions and acceptances across three stores and out of the 14 community calls, we received one rejection. It was just a member who said they love coming to their pharmacy and they want that social interaction due to COVID uh, going on. And others were mostly enrollments or voicemails that we left. 
I would just like to end by saying that our efforts show that there is an increased need of these services to meet the demands of the community. Integrating community perspectives into our daily practice can help us keep with the evolving needs of uh, the places or the settings we serve. Thank you. All right, I'm opening it up to any questions. Thank you for that, that really nice presentation. Um, can you speak into what was the comments from the pharmacists with the results? How did they take to your, um, your evaluation of them and what might be their plans to move forward? Absolutely, I can speak to that. Uh, I have not been associated with Walgreens. Uh, I was just having my shadowing or interning experience over there. And they wanted interns who were in management who had not worked for Walgreens just to assess that if I came into your local community pharmacy, would I be comfortable getting that flu shot uh, or finding out or talking to my pharmacist about getting a Prevnar or something like that. And the best technique that we decided on initially was informing the district manager. So the district managers look over a few stores, about 10 stores, uh, and we decided to not inform pharmacists. We gave them a heads up uh, that we were gonna drop by, but nothing in regards to the immunization rooms. And that ensured us to get the whole experience. So if I came to a counter, what would I uh, feel like? And the pharmacists were pretty open. Uh, suggestions mostly on the administrative side included getting EpiPens, having that Benadryl in a red dot for emergency travel, uh, which is necessary because adverse events are rare, but if they happen, we still need to be prepared at each pharmacy. Thank you. That was quite interesting. We often don't think about the administrative aspects of it, but they are um, really important to the, the health and well-being, the support the health and well-being of the patients. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. All right, we have time for one more question actually. Um, I can ask since <laughs> there's no one else. Uh, I had actually a question around um, the impact because immunizations is definitely an area of of need where pharmacists are providing immunizations in community pharmacy settings. How would you feel like that the impact of the pandemic, how it how it has uh, affected like immunizations administration and what are ways that um, I guess the community could also be helping in that aspect? Because I think there is a lot of misinformation about vaccinations as a whole and the uptake of vaccinations, especially around the COVID um, vaccine. So what were your thoughts around that? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, so as a part, not as my admin rotation, but I followed up on, on another rotation, which was during August and September. And there was a heavy inflow of patients coming in for a vaccine. And most of them did complain that they are not able to get into their primary care for a few months and this was way more accessible. Uh, and I would say 80% of the people I interacted with while getting a flu shot was concerns with keeping up with their other immunizations or about the COVID vaccine. At that point, you just educate them about what you hear from research studies rather than mainstream media. All right, thank you so much for thank your. You. We'll move on to the last presenter, Dr. De, Dr. De Bishop and Kelly Cornelius on lessons learned in the first year of implementing a pharmacist led community based health screening program in underserved Milwaukee neighborhoods. Great, thanks a lot. Um, coming through okay? All good? All good, thank you. Um, Afternoon, everyone. And um, so my name is Mike DeBishop. I'm a faculty uh, in the School of Pharmacy in the Clinical Sciences Department. Um, and wanted to um, 
talk to you today about our uh, team um, who has engaged in a project to create a uh, pharmacist-led um, health and wellness service in the uh, underserved uh, uh, urban neighborhood in Milwaukee. Um, and certainly, you know, I'd like to acknowledge on um, the call today is also uh, Kelly Cornelius, um, so a colleague who has worked on this as well, um, and our other faculty member who was uh, on the project, um, uh, David Ombengi. Um, so I um, want to um, tell you just a little bit about uh, background about our, um, our project. And so um, what the School of Pharmacy did in partnership with um, uh, Nextdoor Foundation, the Nextdoor is a community-based early childhood education center. Uh, we created this program called MCW Neighborhood Partners back in 2018. Um, and the main aim of the program um, was to develop a community-engaged uh, health and wellness service, um, which is led and provided by pharmacists and pharmacy students. Um, and this service um, was trying to improve um, community awareness of health and wellness issues um, through providing health screenings and also trying to increase access to healthcare in Milwaukee area um, target communities. Uh, importantly, um, in a, uh, secondary aim was also to enable our future pharmacists to provide these innovative services in their communities and to help address in the future primary care provider shortages throughout Wisconsin. Uh, so uh, on the left hand side there in order to determine community needs. Um, we uh, engage with the community extensively in the form of listening sessions surveys community events uh, meet and greet events. Um, and the results of these initial community engagement sessions allowed us to determine the screening services and um, to develop um, uh, some of the community service organizations that you see there uh, as key partners with Nextdoor being our primary partner. Uh, we also work closely um, during that time with Metcalf Community Bridges and the COA Golden Center in the uh, Metcalf Park and Amani neighborhoods respectively. So, um, and the partnership with these organizations was really key in accessing the community and providing venues for these health screening services. Um, so after this community engagement, we identified four health screenings um, and that we wanted to provide our initial service. Um, and those are in the middle there. So uh, we um, provided um, blood pressure screening, uh, cholesterol and blood glucose through uh, finger sticks, uh, body mass index screening as well. Uh, and we also provided, uh, when necessary, um, some exercise and diet counseling, as well as health, general health and wellness um, indication. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner um, is uh, kind of some bubbles that show our student roles um, that they have played um, with our uh, program. Um, students rotate um, in rotations throughout their, um, uh, throughout their curriculum, so introductory and advanced. Um, and they have helped uh, develop our clinical protocols. Um, the students, when seeing a client, will do uh, uh, appropriate um, uh, history, uh, including med history, social history, those types of things. They'll perform the physical assessments, including the blood pressures, uh, and administer the CLIA wave point of care tests um, if needed, like cholesterol and blood glucose. Um, and the students um, have the uh, training and ability to interpret those blood uh, tests or those screening tests um, and interpret those for the client, educate them on these areas and, um, you know, maybe uh, make a few recommendations or do some motivational interviewing towards any um, uh, healthy lifestyle uh, changes that might be needed after, um, you know, discussion with the patient. Uh, we have you know, a few of the milestones and results that are um, located um, right to the bottom center of the uh, poster there. Um, so we did lots of um, collaboration meetings as we were setting up and while we were doing our program. Um, we are, our program was open each Friday, um, so students could rotate through it with us. Um, so we were open each Friday from March to December, uh, 2019. Um, we also did nine community events. So in addition to our office, which is located in next door, um, uh, we, uh, did, uh, blood pressures and sometimes the, um, the finger sticks at various community events offsite. Um, over that time, we uh, did 214 encounters, 157 unique clients. Um, and again, a large part of those were at our community events. Um, and we had eight students rotate through during that year. Um, the lessons that we've learned that I've kind of summarized them a little bit in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and we've 
learned a lot of these over this past um, couple of years. And a lot of these are basic community engagement type uh, 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 precepts. Um, but a lot of them kind of uh, uh, stuck home for us in uh, during this process, you know, certainly starting early. Um, lots of meetings um, are necessary to build a lot of these partnerships, as well as being in the community. So we found that, you know, people wanted us to be in the community um, and, you know, be visible. We actually found that a lot of uh, our, um, uh, our connections came through being in the community, going to events, meeting new partners um, through those events. And so that was really rewarding um, to us. Um, we also found that the students can certainly be a valuable resource in this project or in this process. So they developed some, like I said, they developed some of our protocols. We found that both the clients, the community partners, uh, the community members um, have really enjoyed um, working with students and they really provide that different perspective um, and help us to be better as well. Um, one of the things that it's not on the slide that I wanted to mention is we found that um, a recurring theme that is that while preventative health care, um, while it is what we wanted to do, you know, we, what we thought the um, community need from our uh, listening sessions um, was not always the highest priority for some of those that we sought to serve. Um, and we did get the best response when we met the community members at the places where they were, where they were, right? So not asking them to go out of their way, but coming to the places where you were and when they had time to engage with us and sit down and, you know, do some of the screenings. Um, a few folks actually went out of the way uh, to have a health screening. So I think this is where we need to focus on in the future is how do we meet the community where um, they are. Um, certainly last but not least, um, these days more than ever, we want, it's important to be flexible in how we uh, achieve our mission. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we haven't um, been able to go into our um, community centers or, you know, be at events, um, uh, you know, because they are, um, either close to um, community members to us, um, or they just aren't happening at all. And so we've, uh, over the last few months, been trying to explore um, additional avenues, virtual avenues, things like naloxone administration training, uh, providing immunizations, or trying to set up for those virtual education sessions and those types of things. Um, finally, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that, that this project has been made possible uh, through a generous gift from uh, Dr. John and Mrs. Maggie Raymond. Uh, to our school's community health and service learning funds. We're very grateful for their um, uh, generous support. And again, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. All right, there was a question in the chat. Wonderful. How do you think these community engagement experiences will influence the way these future pharmacists will practice in pharmacy? All right, um, I believe that um, what we've learned from talking to our students is um, that they feel like, you know, they, they weren't sure how they could provide these screening services. We teach them in, uh, in classes, you know, we train them to provide them, you know, but how can they do this? How, you know, what's the uh, practical application of, you know, providing them? How do they work with the patients, um, you know, once they're done, um, you know, how do you interpret them for patient and how do you uh, make it meaningful for, the, for that individual? Um, and so I think the students really got a lot of experience in doing that. Um, they did, we did use their students a lot to recruit uh, some of our, uh, you know, to try and recruit some folks. Um, and so I think they got some exposure to a community that um, they may not have had um, exposure in, uh, in that place as well. Second question, do you see yes. any room for interdisciplinary student collaboration in this project? Yes, introducing, yeah, that is one of the goals that we would like to um, see in the future. Um, you know, certainly we need to get back more, um, uh, you know, get our service up and running again. Uh, one of the things we had anticipated from the start um, is involving um, medical students, other disciplines uh, in this type of thing so that, um, you know, provide that further experience of, um, uh, of, of working together um, in the community. You know, when we're there together, we can do more than we can um, apart um, and, uh, or, or separately, I'll say, um, but we'd love to explore more of those inter interdisciplinary um, opportunities, absolutely. All right, thank you so much. We have 